The conflict officially began in 1986, when the first northern rebel movement took up arms against the southern-based Museveni. But the deeper roots of this north-south divide can be traced back to the late 1800s, during what was called by the imperial European powers the scramble for Africa. Colonization was motivated by the European hunger for African resources. The subsequent exploitation of the African people and the uprooting of their spiritual values by Christian missionaries would leave a permanent European stamp on the continent. The mindset is the barbarians are backward and inferior, and for their own benefit, we have to uplift them and civilize them and educate them and so on. The uh, psychology behind it is kind of transparent. I mean, when you've got your boot on someone's neck and you're crushing them, you can't say to yourself, I'm a son of a bitch and I'm doing it for my own benefit. So what you have to do is figure out some way of saying, I'm doing it for their benefit. And that's a, a very natural uh, position to take when you're beating somebody with a club. Britain cut the largest piece of African cake from Cairo to Cape Town, in addition to Nigeria and a few West African regions. It was also the British Empire that in 1894 imposed an arbitrary boundary around the many diverse ethnic groups and kingdoms that would make up Uganda. The southern Bantu-speaking people were given economic, political, and educational advantage. The northern ethnic groups, two in particular, the Acholi and the Langi, were the main recruits for military and police positions. By exploiting linguistic, ethnic, and cultural differences between the peoples of the North and South, Britain's divide and rule policies created a tension between them that helped maintain British rule. The French took an east-west slice of the continent as well as Madagascar. The Belgians took Rwanda, Burundi, and the Congo in what Joseph Conrad called the vilest scramble for loot that ever disfigured the history of human conscience. Slave labor took over five million lives. In Rwanda, Belgium entrenched the idea of the Hutu as a workforce and the Tutsi as extenders of Belgian rule. The politicization of these two cultures would profoundly contribute to the genocide of 1994. In Sudan, the British ruled the Arabs in the north and the blacks in the south as separate colonies only to combine the areas before independence in 1956. The result has been relentless civil war, the Darfur massacres being the latest tragedy. The Portuguese decimated Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau well into the 1970s. The Italians took Libya, Eritrea, and Somalia. The Germans added Cameroon and Tanzania, and committed the first genocide of the 20th century against the Herero people. No colonial power uh, is going to succeed unless it's going to uh, play on existing divisions and sharpen them, increase them, exacerbate them. So one of the first questions after the end of colonialism is who belongs and who doesn't? Uh, who, who, who was part of the colonial struggle and who betrayed. And this is time to settle scores. It was this colonial legacy that Uganda carried forth into its independence in 1962. Milton Obote, a northerner, was named Uganda's first prime minister. In 1971, with the help of Israel and Britain, Obote was overthrown by his top military commander, the notorious Idi Amin. With the entire world looking on, Amin's regime descended Uganda into chaos. For their assumed allegiance to Milton Obote, Idi Amin had thousands of Acholi and Langi soldiers slaughtered. Right from independence, the leaders did not do enough. 
to unite the people in this country. Instead, exploited these differences uh, for their own personal gains. Wanting to rid Uganda of Amin's tyranny, Yauri Museveni spent the 1970s building resistance militias both inside and outside Uganda. The African decline does not begin until the 70s, well over a decade after independence. It coincides with a particular twist in the Cold War, increasing external pressure, the coming in of the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, structural adjustment programs. The World Bank gets countries to borrow up to their necks, you know, usually third world dictators. And then when they can't pay, then the IMF comes in and says, okay, uh, you gotta pay for it with structural adjustment programs. I mean, the poor people who suffer from structural adjustment, they didn't borrow the money. They didn't get anything out of it. And uh, what happened in Africa was happening all over the world. Amin was overthrown in 1979, but it was Milton Obote who returned to power in what Museveni called a rigged election. In opposition, Museveni disappeared into the bush and formed the rebel National Resistance Army, or NRA. The National Resistance Movement is fighting for the aims of the whole country and not for aims of a section of the country. Secondly, the National Resistance Movement is a democratic movement. Museveni rebels took power in 1986. Thousands of defeated Acholi and Langi soldiers, fearing retribution for atrocities committed during the Civil War, fled north. The president did not like the Acholi people, who had dominated the army and the military. So when the president took over power in 1986, he told us that you are Cholis, I'm going to put you in a bottle, like grasshopper. You see a grasshopper, if you put a grasshopper in a bottle, and I will block that bottle, you will see outside and not be able to get out. You look for food and not get it, so you start eating yourself. Although several northern rebel groups formed in opposition to Museveni, only one had a spiritual component. Before there was Joseph Coyne and the Lord's Resistance Army, there was Alice Laquena and the Holy Spirit Movement. Alice Laquena's thing was that the Choli people were very sinful, and she came to correct that. Again, it goes to spiritual. Alice Laquena will tell you exactly what time they're coming, to which area they're going to attack. And true to their word, you'll see them coming with branches of trees carrying AK-47 and singing hymns. And Korn did exactly the same. And this just terrified government troops. In October of 1987, after a number of surprising military successes, Alice Laquena's forces were demolished by Museveni's National Resistance Army, just north of Kampala. Once shunned by Alice Laquena, Joseph Coyne and the Lord's Resistance Army soon became the main rebel force in northern Uganda, with Coyne recruiting some of Laquena's forces and even channeling her main spirit. But Coyne did not prove to be as popular with the people as Laquena and resorted to coercion, abduction, and terror to build his army. 